2020 in Fachphysik, Professor Dr. Reinhard Genzel. And now let's switch to English. That will be the language of this colloquium. It's my pleasure and a big honor for me to moderate this colloquium to honor Professor Reinhard Genzel from the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics uh, for his Nobel Prize in Physics this year. The program will be as follows. We will have a few welcome addresses and then we will go to the talk by Professor Genzel. The first speaker for the welcome address is the president of the Max Planck Society, Professor Dr. Martin Stratmann. Professor Stratmann, you have the word. Yeah, thank you very much, Harald Lesch, for, for this brief introduction. And thank you very much for all of you who have organized this really great, let me say, um, virtual event, this virtual meeting in honor of Reinhard Genzel. It's really a pity that we have been hit by the COVID-19 pandemic in this year of all years, when we are even able to celebrate two Nobel Prizes in the Max Planck Society at the same time. We cannot really travel, we cannot celebrate, we cannot have the joyful events we usually would have, including the huge festival in Stockholm. Nevertheless, we celebrate as good as we can, and therefore I would like to thank everybody for organizing this virtual meeting in, honor, in order to honor Reinhard Genzel. And once again, my warmest congratulations uh, to you, Reinhard, and your entire team. Perhaps I may begin with some personal words. A couple of years ago, I had the pleasure to visit some of the sites that play a key role in the work and career of Reinhard Genzel. For example, I visited together with him Plateau de Bure in France, and I never forget the helicopter flight going there from Grenoble. An exceptional place. And this site honestly would not exist without the strong commitment of Reinhardt and his will to convince me and others for providing continuous financial support. The second site I visited was the VLT on the Paranal, close to the Pacific Ocean. I had a chance to also have a look at the gravity experiment there. And I must admit, I was hugely impressed from what I saw. The instrument was much, much larger than I thought. And we all know, it is one of the most precise instruments in the world. But building instruments is only one aspect of Reinhardt's expertise and the expertise of his whole team. What I found even more fascinating is his deep interest in the basic physics underlying his experimental work. Honestly, I have met very few people in my life who can combine precise scientific questions, deep understanding of the basic phenomena with the ability to tackle those questions using extremely complex experiments. Reinhardt is driven by the science. And in this regard, he makes no compromise, which sometimes may also lead to conflict with others. But at the same time, his straightforwardness and the management skills bring people really together and unite different groups, a necessity if you want to compete with leading groups elsewhere. Also, his honesty and his integrity have made him a very important advisor for me when I was section chair, vice president, and now president of the Max Planck Society. We need those scientists in our community who make no compromise on behalf of scientific quality. Of course, the research of Reinhardt is hugely fascinating. We'll hear about this later on. Just as all astrophysical findings tend to be really fascinating indeed. They stretch our human understanding of the world. They make us humble. They adjust our view on things. And they give us a feeling about how small and fragile we are in all of our doing. Indeed, the fact that the Nobel Prize went now repeatedly to astrophysicists tells me that this field of science has not matured in the very best sense. It is as novel <clears throat> and exciting as ever before. And the Max Planck Society plays a dominant role in this field, even on an international scale. And we, let me say the older generation, Reinhard and myself, we have to make sure that we keep that prominent position so that also in future, we are as attractive as we are right now. And Reinhard Genz and his team are doing so. For example, with their plans for Gravity Plus. Gravity Plus, the next generation of experiment Reinhard is working for, clarifies whether black holes are actually defined by mass and rotation only. 
Gravity Plus should help us to clarify whether quasars are supermassive black holes. Gravity Plus should help us finding new exoplanets. And in fact, even the current gravity exper experiments at Gravity Instrument already, already gave spectacular evidence and revealed the first direct image of the exoplanet Beta uh, Pictoris C recently. The Max Planck Society believes in this research and you know this, Reinhardt supports this research. Furthermore, we are all together, we all together have to fight for further substantial support for our astrophysical experiments, in particular in those times which lay ahead of us, where a deep financial crisis may result of the pandemic we are in today. I know that Reinhardt has always been doing so, but now being a Nobel laureate opens us even more doors. The goal, we as Europeans, we in Germany, we want to maintain our leading position in astrophysics. And the ELT and LISA may be some of the prime experiments which are coming, which we may need. Finally, I want to stress that my congrats also go to the whole team of Reinhardt. And they also go to ESO. Today, we praise, we praise Reinhard Gensel and his work for good reasons. But we also know this success, as to speak, is a multifactorial success. First of all, the Max Planck Society is insanely proud of the whole team of Reinhardt at the MPE. This Nobel Prize is also your Nobel Prize. And we are all happy with you, with everybody who has gone the whole way or part of the way together with Reinhardt. In particular, I have to thank Frank Eisenhower as a mastermind of the instrument building group and the rest of the senior team of the infrared group for their many years of dedication. A success like the discovery of the black hole in the galactic center requires a most reliable interplay, not only in an interferometer, but also between people. Those people who stand behind the project for years and years and years. Thank you all for your continued enthusiasm, your creativity, and your willingness to achieve. In addition, I would like to mention even the best ideas cannot be realized if the scientific environment, including the equipment, is not world-class level. Therefore, the Nobel Prize for Reinhardt is also a Nobel Prize for the ESO. So at that point, in my final point, I would like also to congratulate and thank Dr. Andreas Kaufer, who is the director of the La Silla Paranal Observatory and his team for their constant support of gravity and the other instruments and the Max Planck Society as such. Now coming to an end, I would like to take the opportunity not only to congratulate you, Mr. Gensel Reinhardt, but also to wish you a continued Good luck in future. The future is really wide open in your field, and we are eagerly awaiting the insights which will, um, which will come up with your latest findings. Maintain the intellectual breadth and the depths for which we all admire you. Your ambition, your straightforwardness, your brilliant management skills, and ability to unite researchers of different fields. Your dedication to prepare young scientists for an independent career in science. Over all the years, I have come to know you as a full-blooded scientist, why not? It's a real honor for me to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stratmann. And uh, the next speaker is the president of the Ludwig Maximilians University, Professor Dr. Bernd Huber. Yeah, thank you, Professor Lesch. Um, first, uh, of course, I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Gensel for this Nobel Prize. I have already written a letter to you. Uh, in these days, it's not possible to congratulate in person, but at least we are Zoom meeting uh, to say once again that we are very, very proud uh, of uh, this, uh, that you have gained this prize. And we are particularly proud as uh, LMU, as university, since you have been a honorary professor at our universities for uh, uh, more than 30 years. And uh, therefore, we have a little bit of winner. We are as well in, in uh, with this Nobel Prize. And would like, like 
like also to thank the organizers uh, of the Münchner uh, Physik Colloquium uh, that they organize. It's a very charming and beautiful idea to celebrate uh, Professor Gensler's Nobel Prize in this uh, framework. In addition, uh, it gives me uh, the, the opportunity as an economist to talk in this colloquium. It's probably the only economist in the world who has ever given a talk or uh, said something in the uh, uh, Münchner Physical Colloquium, which is uh, so famous in, in many, many respects. So. Um, well, I'm the president of the university, uh, Professor Stratman is the president of the Max Planck Society, but it's very clear the Nobel Prize uh, is not for institutions, it's uh, for the individual achievements uh, of scientists, and uh, I think this colloquium will highlight uh, what you have, will highlight your contribution in particular, and what you have achieved, which is outstanding in, in, in many respects. Therefore, it's uh, the idea of the individual researcher, and, and of course, of his group of his or her group, uh, one has to say, uh, which is, uh, is a basis uh, for the Nobel Prize. And uh, uh, well, that's, uh, I think, the basic idea of, of this prize. And uh, but in addition, and, and that's a point which I would like to highlight. And therefore, that's another reason uh, why all of us uh, in Munich can be very proud of this. It also highlights uh, the unique role of uh, Munich uh, as a scientific and academic hub, as a first-rate academic place in the world, and therefore uh, you will surely benefit all of us in terms of reputation, in terms of recognition uh, from your Nobel Prize. Therefore, that's uh, also an opportunity to thank you for what you have done uh, for the scientific and academic area in Munich. And now it's the time uh, uh, just uh, to celebrate uh, uh, your prize. And uh, we are very happy uh, to be with you. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave to, to go to, to, to another uh, meeting, uh, but we, I wish you well and uh, enjoy all, all of you uh, this uh, physical colloquium today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Huber. <clears throat> um, Maybe I should make it at least, I, I cannot stop to make a joke. Maybe you, as, as an economist, maybe you, you, should, you should listen to a talk about black holes. Because in economy, from time to time, there appear black holes, and then we don't know uh, how, to, how the dynamics around yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, OK, OK, thank you. OK, the next speaker. An economy tends to be in a black hole uh, most of the time, actually. It's very difficult <laughs> to understand. <laughs> That would be my answer in this respect for the, Thank you. For the and time being. Time. Okay. Stay healthy. The, the, our next speaker is uh, the Senior Vice President of the Technical University in Munich, Professor Gerhard Kramer. Do you have the word, please? Thank you, uh, Professor Lesch. And I'd like to also start by saying congratulations to Professor Gensel on your Nobel Prize. Um, I've had the distinct pleasure as not an economist or a physicist, but as an electrical engineer to meet uh, two physics Nobel Prize winners in the last two years. Um, the first was Arthur Ashkin, who I met in New Jersey uh, two years ago, which was really a wonderful experience. Uh, and this year, Reinhard Gensel. Um, my role here for this short reading is to represent the Technical University of Munich, or TUM, and TUM's connection to Professor Gensel is threefold. First, his Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics is located on the same research campus in Gahim, where TUM has many of its faculties, physics, chemistry, informatics, mathematics, mechanical engineering, and soon electrical and computer engineering. Second, Professor Gensel is a member of the Origins Excellence Cluster that investigates the origin of the universe and life. This large project is a collaboration with our partner research organizations, the LMU, the Max Planck Foundation, and as already mentioned, the European Southern Observatory that is also located in Gaixing, along with its ESO Supernova Planetarium. The Origins Cluster also includes the Leibniz Rechen Centrum or Supercomputer Center of the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities that is located across the street from Professor Jensel's Institute. And as this breadth 
shows, the Origins Cluster is an outstanding example of what a collaborative, we now call it a one Munich strategy, can accomplish by connecting and supporting the many tremendous scientific um, people who are in Munich. Third, and perhaps somewhat unique, Professor Gensel was for eight years a member of the TUM Appointment and Tenure Board from its founding in 2012 until this summer. This board is responsible for selecting tenure track assistant professors and for evaluating the tenure cases for the entire university. Tenure track programs are relatively new in Germany and have grown tremendously in recent years that provide an attractive career option for young researchers, similar to what you will know in other countries in North America and Asia, for example. And at TUM alone, we have hired over 140 assistant professors into the program since 2012. So you can imagine the time and dedication that Professor Genzel brings to serving the Munich area in addition to his scientific impact. So to conclude, I would like to say one more thing. Thank you, Professor Gensel, for your service to our university, to our young scientists, and to the Munich area in general. It was a pleasure to get to know you in this role. I didn't know that you were on the shortlist for a Nobel Prize when we did meet. And in any case, I do hope we have the chance to interact again. Uh, in the near future. I look forward to the presentation. Thank you for letting me speak here also to the organizers. Thank you very much. So the, the last welcome address is by the Dean of the Faculty of Physics, Professor Ralf Bender. Ralf, it's up to you. Good evening together, <clears throat> dear Reinhardt, dear President Stratmann and Huber, dear Vice President Kramer, dear colleagues. Um, this is really an unusual colloquium, unusual times. Usually would have already a few drinks. Um, we don't have those, we, we don't have drinks afterwards. But nevertheless, I think um, this is a very unusual and worthwhile colloquium to celebrate Reinhardt and his achievements and also Reinhardt's group's achievements, which go together very closely. Now, I worried that President Stratmann or one of the other uh, previous speakers would have said a lot of what I could possibly say. So I thought a bit harder what I could do to complement, you know, kind of the general things one would say at these things. And I, I profited from the fact that I lived, you know, more than 25 years close to Reinhardt uh, in the same building in Munich, and I watched him how, you know, how his group works, how he works. And there were a lot of lessons for me, I have to say. I mean, some I knew before, but I learned a lot by just watching them. And so I thought an interesting aspect I could talk about is the simple question, what does it take to be such an exceptional scientist like Reinhard Gensel? Now, don't worry, Reinhard, it's nothing dangerous I will talk about. <laughs> so, um, now, these 25 years helped a, lot, helped a lot, and I could see, you know, how with persistence and energy and, you know, con continuing uh, going deeper and getting better, Reinhardt could finally show that the massive dark object in the galactic center is really a black hole. And you now, as I said, in the course of this process, I realized there is probably several elements which make an exceptional scientist like Reinhardt. Um, and many good scientists have, you know, several of these elements realized, but not all of them. And I think Reinhardt is one of the few persons uh, in who I know who really, you know, has all these elements to make exceptional scientists that actually can become a Nobel Prize winner. Um, for the sake of beauty, I, you know, I decided that these should be seven elements. And let's first, let's start with the first element. And it starts at the beginning, of course. So that the obvious first thing you need to be is bright. That's no surprise. But when you are doing your PhD and you are entering your postdoc, or better even during the PhD, it's very important that you make a unique contribution early on so that people start to get you know. 
So some people succeed, others don't. Reinhardt succeeded very early by you know, investigating molecular lines around massive stars, water vapor masers, and he could show that these massive stars drive out flows. This was at the time a very novel uh, area of research with novel instrumentation, and it gave him immediate recognition in the scientific community. So um, note that his first author paper, first first author paper appeared in Nature. That's quite unusual, right? And by now, if you look at his work published based on his PhD thesis at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn, um, these papers have over 3,000 citations. So Reinhardt had a, you know, a rocket-like start in, into the career, and that's, that's crucial if you want to get far. Now, and only three years after he finished his PhD in 1978, so in 1981, he became an associate professor in Berkeley, you know, one of the best universities in the world. That's an achievement. So very few people succeed in that. That's, that's the, so one, the first element to be successful is to, to start early and to push hard. So the first years, and it's, you know, especially on the, for the younger scientists among us, for the students and postdocs, you know, the first years are those that matter extremely. Of course, later, it's also important that you are successful, but, but the first years are very important. The second, and that's, you know, what, almost following from the previous, the second element is if you really want to achieve outstanding results, you need to fully dedicate and focus yourself on your project. Say something unpopular, forget work-life balance and the like, and I think this word wasn't actually not known during Reinhardt's times and my times when we wrote our PhD thesis. It's like sports or music. The more you exercise, the better you get. Your chances of a breakthrough, they just get larger the more you, you dedicate yourself. And everybody who knows Reinhardt a bit knows that he has this full dedication and this focus on projects. He's the perfect illustration of this principle. Let me add, on the side also note, and this, this uh, is another, gives it another twist. Uh, some of you may know that Reinhardt also was a very dedicated javelin thrower. He actually was as good in it, in it that he could have joined the German Olympic team. But he decided that science was more important for him. So he, he and, and this was a wise choice because if he had continued with the javelin throwing, probably he would not have had this impact in such a short time. Now, that's the beginning. The third element is about is a bit later. Once you had a very good start and you are about to establish yourself, you need to think about the next projects. Well, sometimes you, some people just carry on with their PhD projects forever. It's a bit boring, but uh, you know, in some cases, even you know, you carry on with your project, but it give, gets you a completely new twist. So it's important for the medium term to find an ambitious and worthy research goal, maybe two or three to be safe, but not too many because that's risky, as I said above. And these goals should be ambitious. They should have the potential of being of fundamental importance. And obviously, you know, Reinhardt made the right choice 40 years ago when he decided to work on the Galactic Center. Now, from now, this almost sounds trivial, but it's in fact, uh, if you think 40 years ago, it was not trivial at all. Nobody knew what we now know today. I mean, what kind of instruments we can have, how close we can get to the black hole that we actually can show and that Reinhardt has showed that the massive dark object in the galactic center is really a black hole. You couldn't know that 40 years ago that this goal ever would ever be reached. So, but it was, it's the right goal to have, you know, it's an ambitious project. And, you know, as I said, Reinhardt didn't just put all the eggs in one basket. So he also pursued uh, the other research uh, developing out of his early PhD work and star formation, galaxy evolution, interstellar medium and so on. And he had a huge impact in these fields as well. Um, and, you know, when you look at his citations, a large fraction of his citations also are from these uh, additional fields of research. The fourth aspect is 
or the fourth element, if you want, is you have to overcome inevitable setbacks, not become demoralized, but carry on. I mean, it's almost trivial to say this, but it's never this important because sometimes you forget it. Now, Reinhardt has suffered setbacks and had problems, but he carried on. And often from the outside, you wouldn't even see that he has a problem if you, if you don't know him well enough, right? Uh, sometimes you could hear from a mumbling or grumbling that he has a problem, but usually these were not the big ones. So, uh, you know, a, a, a perfect example for setbacks are space projects. Reinhardt has also done a major part of a space project with Herschel. And it was named differently before projects get merged. Sometimes you almost think uh, they never happen and so on. And, uh, but in the end, it's important to continue and, you know, to succeed. But, you know, it's not always worth that you continue and finish a project. It's also important that you sometimes realize it doesn't make sense to continue. You know, in economy, I'm not sure whether our president is still around. In economy, there's the rule, don't throw good money after bad. You know, many scientists, once they are on track and they have invested a lot of time, I mean, it's a very human trade, then you, you, know, you just want to continue. You want to get it to the end. But I think Reinhardt is one of those persons, and I admire him for that, that at some point he said, no, it's enough. We have, we have spent enough, we have worked enough, but it's not worth it. The return from that project will not justify further investment. And he stopped the project. That's a very important capability one has to have. So these are the first four elements, so to speak. Um, they are kind of high flying, now more, some more down to earth decisions. These are the three next elements. You know, the one thing, depending on who you are, for theorists, life is a bit easier or I get, now they will complain to me, but it's really true. Experimental search cannot be done anyway, anywhere, sorry. Um, you know, it's always, you need resources, you need uh, rooms, you need students to do experiments. And therefore, you know, it's important which institution you choose, or rather which institution chooses you. You just have to be good enough that you can choose the institution. That's very important. And an outstanding institution is characterized, I would think, and, and we probably all agree in this, by valuing excellence and you know, your excellence. And once they've hired you, by granting you the time, the freedom, and the trust to pursue your goals, even if they cannot be achieved within a year. I think it's this long-term perspective that makes German universities in many ways unique, and in particular the Max Planck Society unique, because in addition, you know, the trust is even larger because there is more money involved if you are Max Planck director. So uh, the other thing is you need to be connected with the university, as Reinhardt was connected with LMU now uh, for, I think, uh, 35 years. And many good students joined his team during that time. And you know he uh, supported the students, mentored them, and many went on to very good jobs. So this was a very good symbiosis, having the Max Planck Society as your main base and having a university and also, of course, the technical university nearby to give you students and work with them. So before I get to element six, and this is, this is an element that has been covered by uh, Professor Stratman already uh, in some degree, I think I need to add a sentence or two how modern astrophysics works, because not all physicists have an understanding for that. Now we have essentially, astrophysics essentially come in four flavors. We have observers, modelers, simulators and instrument builders. Most of today's astronomers fall into one of the first three categories, and often they stand on two legs. So they are observers and modelers, or they are simulators and modelers. And the vast majority of observers by now often uses publicly available telescopes and instruments, and then they take data and then they observe and model. So they, they don't they understand how an instrument works, but they would not be able to build one. And that's not a problem today because you know, astrophysics is such a rich field. There are so many data coming in 
uh, which need to be interpreted and modeled. So there is great value in having so many observers and modelers around. Um, and the other reason is, of course, modern instruments, as you, as Reinhardt builds them for the very large telescope, or in the future for the ELT um, of ESO, you know, they are so complex and so large that you need a lot of expertise to build one. So it's very rare that one person actually sets out as an idea, builds the instrument, the ideal instrument to address this question, carries out the observations, models the data, and even adds simulations if needed. And Reinhardt and his group do just that, right? So Reinhardt's research was always driven by a goal. And you know, if the instrument wasn't available that he needed, then he just built it. And in this way, you know, he, he pushed the limits of instrumentation. He was always keen to develop something new, to use you know, the best possible technology, even if it wasn't well proven yet, and bring it to the telescope. And everybody profited, not just Reinhardt in this group, the whole you know, community profited from that. You know, the ESO community profits from the instruments Reinhardt and his group built. So that's you know, one of the exceptions uh, where Reinhardt, uh, so the, the seven, the six uh, element, it, Reinhardt is really unique in, but he's really unique in all previous ones. And the seventh one already, that has already mentioned uh, by Professor Stratman is as a universally gifted astrophysicist like Reinhardt, so to speak, a Renaissance astrophysicist, you also need a good team. Otherwise, you couldn't you know, develop all the ideas. You couldn't build what you wanted to build. You just need superb people. And Reinhardt has built such a team over the last 40 years. Members of this team have a vast range of expertise, and they could have been easily professors somewhere else. Actually, several got offers to be professors somewhere else. But it decided to stay with Reinhardt simply because they insp he inspired them and because his vision of what could be done became theirs too. So building this team was of critical importance for the success we celebrate today and for which the Nobel Prize was awarded. And I also want to just mention Frank Eisenhower and Linda Takoni and Natasha Förster-Schreiber as key players in the team. So these are the seven main elements for an outstanding career. And I think I hopefully have convinced you that Reinhardt has really excelled in all seven of them. He is really, really outstanding. And it's this combination that makes him such a unique scientist. And uh, that's, of course, you know, the uniqueness we have been shown with an award of the Nobel Prize. So let me um, just add a little historic perspective uh, before I conclude. And you know, let me span this perspective a bit wider than the 40 years Reinhardt will talk about uh, in a moment. And, and this deals with, you know, that the whole research actually started in Munich at the end of the last century. So some people of you are certainly surprised, but this is how the story goes. In 1892, there was a PhD student that joined at the, the then Royal Bavarian Observatory now known as the University Observatory of LNU. The student supervisor was uh, Hugo von Seliger, the director of the observatory. And you can see actually a picture of Seliger on the wall behind me here. You know, he has the grim looks of a German professor uh, of the time with a beard and something like, like me. And you see also the space. This is, to the left there is uh, Fraunhofer, Utschneider, and Reichenbach, the famous instrument builders. And the space in the middle is for Reinhardt. I only need a grim picture from you, Reinhardt, for that. <laughs> and um, OK, anyway, back to Seliger. And Seliger accepted a student who was really brilliant. That student was Karl Schwarzschild. He joined uh, the observatory in 1896, wrote a PhD thesis about figures of rotating liquids, read stars. Then he went on for a postdoc to the Kufner Observatory near Vienna uh, for two years, but returned to Seliger in 1899 
to write for two years his habilitation at LMU. And his habilitation was yet about another subject, but during that time he started thinking about non-Euclidean space. He gave a talk in 1900 where he discussed that the space around us was non-Euclidean. Now, at the time when nobody talked about this, in the same year, he actually published a paper giving a lower limit for the radius of curvature of space as at least two and a half thousand light years, which is a bit tiny for modern standards. But you know, think about this imagination. So you can imagine that Schwarzschild, you know, even 15 years before general relativity was thinking about curved space, not space time, but just space. But it prepared his mind for general relativity. And so with, within a very, very short time after the equation of general relativity had been published by Einstein, his mind was set to, to invent the metric that's called after him and you know that we now describe non-rotating black holes with. So to some degree, you could say, you know, black hole research, at least the very seeds of it were planted in Munich around 1900. Now with your work, Reinhardt, you have grown these seeds to a full tree of maturity and you have secured Munich a top place in the hall of fame of black hole research. So to conclude, Reinhardt, let me thank you personally for being such a great colleague and inspiring person. You see the lessons I learned from you, the seven elements of a successful scientist. It's wonderful to have you in Munich and we wish you many more years of brilliant research along the road you are already paving with gravity and Mikado at the ELT. On behalf of the Faculty of Physics of LMU and all physics colleagues in Munich, I raise my glass and congratulate you, even if it's only water for now, but I hope we can do this with champagne at some point. Congratulations, Reinhardt. Yes. Uh, I, will, I will just say a few words. Um, which has not been talked about because everybody has now heard about his uh, curriculum vitae. And um, when, when I give talks uh, in, the, in the pre corona time, um, there was always a kind of a very, let's say, cheap, cheap, uh, cheap joke. But uh, if in case there was a mobile phone ringing, I was always saying, maybe you should listen to it. Perhaps it's Stockholm. Well, here we have a man who got a call from Stockholm <laughs> and he was very surprised. But when you listen to the list of his prizes and his medals, then you, 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 would, you would agree with me that he should not be surprised. When you look at a list like this one that he, he, he received the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft already uh, 30 years ago. He got the Stern Gerlach Medal for Experimental Physics from the German Physical Society, the Balsam Prize for Infrared Astronomy, the Albert Einstein Medal of the Switzerland Albert Einstein Society. He received the Shaw Prize, which is very prestigious, the Karl Schwarzschild Medal of the Astronomical Society also, the Tycho Brahe Prize, the Crawford Prize from the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, etc., etc. He received the Orden Pour le Merit, and he's a member of several astronomical societies and national academies of science. So if you would make a poll in the last years, um, at least in, in the astronomical community, and uh, you, you would ask who would receive the Nobel Prize in physics, then the name Reinhard Genzel would appear on many, many lists. And so it's really a big pleasure for me and a great honor to introduce to you the Nobel Prize winner in physics of the year 2020, Professor Dr. Reinhard Genzel from the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garching. Reinhard, it's up to you. Well, thank you, dear Harald, lieber Herr Stadtmann, lieber Herr Huber, lieber Herr Kramer, lieber, lieber Ralf. Wow, um, I'm a little shocked. Um, you know, my father once told me that if you were to get a eulogy like this, you would most likely be dead because that shouldn't really happen to you. So now I've learned something new, which is, ooh, if you do, if you get a Nobel Prize, maybe you have a chance at this too. Dear colleagues, this is, 
absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm deeply embarrassed. I am not sure I can give you a scientific talk, but I'll, I'll try it anyhow. Um, try it anyhow. So I'm sharing the screen now. Okay, dear colleagues. So what I'm gonna to do is to tell you what I've called a 40 year journey. Really it's a 50 year journey, but the first 10 years, I, I was only a beginning in the field. And what a, what a journey this was. And it's part of another journey, which I'll come to next. It's a journey of basically, on the one hand, uh, proving that what the theory of general relativity had predicted uh, really is realized in the universe. But at the same time, it's also exploring what I call the forest of the universe and finding objects uh, and uh, understand about their role in the universe. So as you see in this timeline here, from left to right, starting in the 1970s, well, you, you'll see why I'm starting there. So today, in this small section of black hole research, as you will appreciate, in the Galactic Center, we've seen you know, 40 years of wonderful progress. The Galactic Center is one of the best performers I could imagine in terms of giving us a laboratory where we can do physics, but also to understand uh, the astrophysics of this whole problem, which is enormously rich. I'll try to touch on both of these as I go through the stages in time, which I differentiate into four different phases. Now, of course, there were those people who were before us, and I'll mention those, some of them you see on top, the theorists. There's Jan Ort, who looked at the galactic center for many years. Uh, Martin Rees and Donald Lindenbell, who, as you will see, played an enormously important role in pointing us in the right direction. And then there was my, in many ways, second father, my mentor, Charlie Towns, uh, who got the Nobel Prize for the Maser and Laser, and whose group I joined in the 80s, when he already was on his way to start working on this project. So I merely have actually uh, finished what Charlie already started. Then below, you find some other characters, uh, perhaps the, the younger generation, if you like, uh, who started and completed this project. Uh, you see there Gary Neugebauer and Eric Becklin, people of the first years of or exploration of the Milky Way and also the Galactic Center. John Lacey, then Fred Lowe, Andreas Eckhart, who worked with me for many years and still is with gravity. Then Andrea Guess, who, as you will see, uh, led the second group in this field, achieving very much the same science and thereby making the two of us, so to speak, a, a, a dancer duo with our teams, where the scientific community at large had a very good chance to check out immediately what was right and what was wrong by comparing what the two of us would say. Then there's Mark Reed, Mark Morris, there's Claire Max who developed the lasers. And then let me in particular say there was Pierre Lenard. Pierre Lenard who was one of the great fathers of the VLT, who early on knew that interferometry uh, might very well be one day be the right way of getting at the highest resolution and which has been now realized. Then two of my close colleagues, Stefan Gillison and of course, Frank Eisenhower and the entire gravity team who you will get to meet during this story. But let's start as the prologue uh, uh, from the very beginning, which of course was initially 
triggered by the discovery of quasars in the 1960s. The radio astronomers had uh, found objects which uh, nobody else had seen before. Optical astronomers like Martin Schmidt using the Palomar telescope uh, took pictures and found uh, objects which looked like stellar objects. But then in their spectra, they found spectral lines redshifted by 16% of the speed of light. Well, 16% meant if you believe the uh, redshift is due to the expansion of the universe, uh, a distance of uh, 2.4 billion uh, light years. That means that that little light speck uh, really has a thousand times the luminosity of the Milky Way. And since it looks like a star, most of that radiation comes from a fraction of a light year. That was a sensational discovery. How could you possibly understand the energetics of these so-called quasars? And there were many people who worked on that. And it was really then that the connection between astronomy on the left side and the already existing wonderful mathematical work on the theory of general relativity, Schwarzschild's work, Penrose's work, and Roy Kerr came together. Roy Kerr, whom I talked about this, uh, uh, 10 years ago, basically said, well, you know, when we, when I, when I delivered my solution, uh, nobody really was all in, in the astronomy era was all that excited about it because, you know, nobody knew, would know that there was really a connection. That was the first time then that a connection came up because a number of people amongst whom we have London, Lyndon Bell, Reese, uh, Rashid Sonyaev, uh, Blanford and others realized that if you let material fall into a black hole, a massive black hole of millions to billions of solar masses, then before entering the event horizon and disappearing into the black chasm, you could convert up to 40% of the rest energy of the infalling material into radiation, 10 to 40%. And that's almost a factor of 100 more efficient than fusion in stars. So that seemed a likely a outrageous but likely possibility for explaining these quasars, which then were discovered in large numbers and at ever higher redshift. We now have uh, quasars uh, which already were active and large only about six, 700 million years after the Big Bang. In addition, the X-ray astronomers and the gamma ray astronomers found high energy radiation coming from the cores of quasars. And uh, radio astronomers found what we call radio jets, collimated uh, beams of highly ionized material almost traveling at the speed of light. So by the end of the 60s and the early 70s, many astronomers, not all, many astronomers felt uh, that, you know, maybe, maybe it was massive black holes uh, accreting lots of material in certain periods of time, which could explain quasars. But how would you prove that? I mean, in order to measure the mass of an object and the size of it, you have to resolve it spatially at a distance of billions of light years. No, that's not possible. So Lyndon Bell and Reese wrote a very influential paper in 1971 saying, well, uh, uh, if quasars are just, so to speak, the lucky ones who happen to be uh, creating materials, maybe the more general case is that every uh, galactic center has a black hole. Most are quiet because there's not much material coming in, but the mass is there. And if that is true, maybe even local galaxy might have such black holes. And maybe one could find there so much closer uh, the evidence for it. And so by the end of the 1970s, the race started. It started with optical observations in nearby galaxies, which I won't have time to describe in detail. And it started in the galactic center with Charlie Towns uh, having built for the first time infrared instruments to penetrate into the center of the Milky Way. And here we are flying uh, from the outside in, uh, and you see the dark material there, that's the dust. 
which is between the stars and attenuating uh, optical light by about a factor of 10 to the 12. So unfortunately, you cannot actually do the galactic center problem in the optical. You have to go to a longer wavelength, at least to the infrared. And we have now infrared waves, which we're looking at, uh, radio or short wavelengths like X-rays. And so Becklin and Neugebauer were then able to see what you're now seeing in some detail uh, at low resolution, which is a very dense nuclear star cluster, about a million times as much mass per volume as, as we have in our lo local solar neighborhood. And in the years afterwards, Towns and his colleagues started looking at gas and dust surrounding that central region. The blue is the stars and green is neutral gas and reddish colors denote ionized gas, the so-called mini spiral. So Towns and his students had built a spectrometer uh, working on a line of ionized ne neon at 12 micrometers, which could see the motions of this ionized gas through the Doppler effect. And see on the right side here, basically, there's a series of measurements of the velocity uh, of the ionized gas along this northern straight uh, streamer. And you see from the, from the change of velocity, you can make a model, assuming that this is actually a falling cloud which tells you that the mass inside of the innermost point of that cloud has to be between two and five million solar masses. And it was clear when these measurements uh, it became available that if the interpretation is right, that this cannot be due to stars. Then the other, the other streamers gave similar estimates. At about the same time, the radio astronomers started making ever sharper images uh, of the central region and inside of this filamentary uh, uh, extended plasma, they found a radio source, which was very, very compact, essentially unresolved with uh, interferometry in the early days. And what you see in the left diagram is as a function of wavelength, the size in log log units. And you see as shorter wavelength you go to, the smaller the size. And that has to do with the fact that in front of the galactic center, there's ionized gas, uh, electrons, which scatter the radio waves. So the actual intrinsic size is much smaller than what you think. So you have to go to the shortest wavelength, about a millimeter in wavelength, to then see what the intrinsic size of the source is. And the surprise is, it's about you know, 20, 30 micro arc second. A micro, 10 micro arc second is about a euro cent on the moon. So that's truly a compact source. And indeed, the 4 million solar mass uh, concentration, which already towns had found in the center there, uh, uh, would have an event horizon size of about 10 micro arc seconds. So that would be the description of what really had to be done. We start following this first phase uh, in the 1970s from the gas motions. It was clear there was a mass of several million solar masses, which you see on the left side there. And that was not very accurately known, maybe to 20%, 30% or so. And on the right side, you see that this mass had to be within about a fraction of a parsec, maybe half of a parsec, a few light years, or 10 to the six Schwarzschild radii. So that's pretty compact, but it's far, far away from a black hole. So in 91, that was the evidence we had. In fact, in 85, we wrote a nature paper, Crawford et al., where we basically presented all the evidence at that time. And in Berkeley, we thought we, we were pretty sure that this must be a several million solar mass black hole. But nobody else really believed us. Why? Well, because gas can be pushed around by, by magnetic fields or by winds of, of, of stars. So you can't be sure that really you're, you're looking when you're measuring these motions you're looking at gravity, it could be something else. 
So when I then went from Berkeley to Munich, it was clear to make progress on this project. We had to number one, measure more precisely. We had to measure on smaller scales than the, the half a parsec. And we had to go to measure stars instead of gas in order to be sure that we would measure gravity. And that required new instruments. And one of the key things, of course, you want to go to high resolution imagery in the infrared is to overcome the blurring of the Earth's atmosphere, what they call seeing. And that blurring can be overcome by taking very rapid shooting of, of images so fast that you freeze the, 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 the seeing effects of the atmosphere. So then you go to a good telescope with a new camera and a detector which just had been developed in the United States for the space telescope uh, uh, instrumentation, which had low enough to uh, read noise that we could basically see in about a half a second integration, the galactic center. And you can see there are these speckles, only a few of them. And by post-processing, you could then go down to the diffraction limit of a three and a half meter telescope, which is this uh, telescope on the right there, the uh, test telescope for the VLT uh, on, on La Silla. So then we could, by stacking the images, Andreas Eckert and Lorena Hoffmann, we could get these, these sharper images with, with speckle imagery. At the same time, uh, we wanted to also have spectra, very much like what Towns had done, but, but, but not by pointing uh, at one star at a time. That's not very efficient. We wanted to have imaging spectroscopy. So we invented what is now called integral field spectroscopy, where you take a two-dimensional field on top, and then you slice it optically into a long slit, and then you pass this long slit through a dispersive uh, spectrometer, a grading spectrometer, thereby on a two-dimensional detector, you have, the, you, can, you have the data for reconstructing the image for each wavelength uh, uh, in your slice. So these two technologies uh, were the, the, the key for the second phase. We started that in 91, 92, our uh, uh, colleague, Andrea Guest by that time, had gone to UCLA after her PhD and started a group there. And she also started very much uh, like we did, uh, uh, speckle, speckle imaging. She didn't have an, an integral field spectrometer, but she had a much bigger telescope, namely the Keck telescopes. So here the two groups were taking uh, pictures, typically uh, five, six, 10 pictures every year on a modern high resolution eight meter uh, picture of the galactic center. The cross in the center there is the position of the radio point source Sagittarius A star, which uh, is uh, X marks the spot where everyone would have thought that this might be the location of the central mass and uh, circle denotes about a light month. So that's, that's very compact uh, region. You see there are many stars there Ten thousands of stars, and we started basically uh, going ahead and and taking these uh, sharp images. So did the Keck group, and after about a few years, five years or so, we were seeing the first motions. I've depicted that here on this graph here, uh, from three consecutive years in red, in green, and in blue. Again, the green cross is Sag A star and the light month circle, and then you see. Uh, the stars are moving. And in fact, they're moving very rapidly in the inside. If you look on the upside, or upper right, there's a, a marker. So one of the stars was moving at uh, more than 1,000 kilometers per second. And the mass must be concentrated because, as you see, you go away from the, the green uh, spot, the green cross, the prism effects diminish. That's exactly what you would expect if there's a Keplerian law. Think of the planets around the sun. The outer planets move slower than the inner ones by one over the square root of distance. And indeed, when you put this information you see on the right in a statistical sense, in quantitative fashion, uh, you find that the velocity, the average velocity of the stars 
uh, within about 30 arc seconds or so, increase like one of a squared of R. <clears throat> and if you convert then the amplitude into a mass, you get two and a half million solar masses. Wow, that's the same mass which Towns and our group in Berkeley had delineated 10 years earlier uh, with the gas. So the gas motions actually told us the right story. But now, of course, we are much further in. We are now not at one parsec, but a fraction of a parsec. So at the end of this phase two in 98, here, both the Keck group and our group were working more or less parallel. We had a better mass. It was more accurate. As you see, now we're at the level of 10% accuracy. And most importantly, we were now at a, a distance of a, of a, a few tenths of, a, of, uh, of light years, or two by 10 to the five Schwarzschild radii. So we have now concentrated the same mass, which we saw in the first phase, to a much smaller volume by, by a factor of 100 or so. So very little really at that point uh, was realistically fitting into this region. And we were pretty convinced we had a, a good case. And actually most of the astronomers believed this. Not so the physicists, the physicists were still skeptical. And so uh, what should we do next? Well, what we have here is of course based on the average motion of stars because we, we cannot measure the three dimensional um, velocities and position, six phase space coordinates, which would be necessary to delineate a, an orbit. So can we get orbits for individual stars? Well, we ran, we ran some, some, some simulations and most of the orbits would have hundreds to thousand years uh, of orbital periods. That's too much, even for Max Planck directors. And so we, uh, we went ahead, not being very sure whether we could get actually beyond the linear motions. But then in 2000, in fact, both of the groups now were located at the eight meter telescopes. We had equipped now these eight meter telescopes with what, with what is now known as adaptive optics. So not any more uh, short exposure spectral imaging. Now we would repair the distortions of the atmosphere before the detec detection by deformable mirrors, laser using lasers in part uh, to be able to get very accurate corrections where there was no bright star in the sky. So we were using the uh, one of the eight meter telescopes of the, the ESO VLT and uh, Andrea and her collaborators were using uh, the one uh, Keck number one and then later on Keck number two uh, telescopes. And so Andrea in 2000 published a nature paper where she showed for three stars the first deviations from linear motion. So here we had the first inkling, if you're patient, you might be able to get orbits. And it took really only, only two years until this one star, which is labeled here S2 or S02, actually came around the, the, the turn and turned out to be on a highly elliptical orbit. A highly elliptical orbit with a peri distance in 2002 of a mere 17 light hours. 17 light hours is solar system scales. That's about three times Neptune's orbital radius. And, and the motion velocity at that point is about 2.6% speed of light, about 7,600 kilometers per second. So that's getting into the, the relativistic range where relativistic effects uh, you know, can become uh, important. And so at that point, we knew the mass. We knew that the same 3 million solar masses was contained now in within uh, 17 light hours, which we had seen before. And so at that point, uh, looking now at the, the green area and following in the next 10 years, the measurements got ever better. The precision got ever better. There was also, as you see, a change in the level. Uh, so the mass uh, increased. That is due to the fact that initially we had assumed statistically that the motions were circular which they aren't. Most of the, mass, most of the motions 
are on elliptical orbits. So that's why this average mass is, is not two and a half, but four million solar masses. And the accuracy had come down by a factor of you know, several to only a few percent. The key thing is on the right side. Now we had basically squished that four million solar masses from before a few hundred thousand Schwarzschild radii to a hundred Schwarzschild radii. So within that region, there is very little which can characteristically still fit in there. There are a number of possibilities you can discuss. For instance, you could have a cluster of uh, neutron stars, uh, tens of millions of, uh, a few, few millions of neutron stars, or you could have a few hundred thousand stellar black holes. But if you have such a dark astrophysical cluster, that's not stable. So in fact, you know, these lifetimes uh, delineated there of clusters, which might just barely fit the bill, uh, less than 100,000 years. So that's not very realistic for a star cluster, which clearly has stars in them, which are uh, more than a giga year in, in lifetime. So that's when really very few possibilities remain. There you see there's the word boson star. That's a highly hypothetical a conglomerate of bosons, say Higgs bosons or whatever you might want to uh, take uh, to construct a compact but not black hole-like system, purely purely uh, theoretical construct. So by that phase, by the end of that phase, we had a very good case, the best case really in astronomy. We had excluded all other uh, cases beyond any reasonable doubt. So were we done? Should we have stopped? No, because you cannot be sure that this is a black hole unless we assume uh, that uh, general relativity holds. And it's possible that general relativity in this extreme parameter space is not the right theory. So we actually, uh, by 2004, knowing that the star S2 would come back in 2018 on its 15 year life uh, orbital period, we knew that we had to be able to measure still more accurately by at least a factor of 20 in order to approach the event horizon, in order to measure everything yet by another factor of 10 or better, uh, in order to A, see the effects of general relativity and B, concentrate, uh, you know, make a case that the mass really is concentrated on the scale of an event horizon. So that required a new instrument called gravity and combined all four eight meter telescopes of ESO. So here they are. Previously, we had used the right one there, UT4, but then ESO in the meantime, owing to the you know, you know, prevalent thinking of uh, a number of people in particular uh, Pierre Lénard had provided uh, infrastructure below the mountaintop, which you can see here, where you have little carriages, which you can have on rails to combine the light from all the four meter, from all the four eight meter telescopes and, and, and basically combine it in a way that you can detect the fringes in a phase coherent fashion. But then to do this combination, uh, you need to build a, a beam combiner instrument, which we called gravity. And Frank Eisenhower and his team did just a, a miracle development in about a decade to build this instrument, which you see below, which is a big tank uh, where, you know, in, in, in cryogenic environments using monomode fibers on very small scales, you can analyze the light, bring it together in, in um, what is basically a beam combination technology, which has been invented in the communication industry, and then uh, measure the fringes. With gravity, we have uh, you know, another factor of 15, 20 better resolution, since we, we effectively create a 130 meter diameter telescope with it. And the astrometry is another factor of, uh, yeah, 30 or so better than what we can do with a single telescope. We can do spectroscopy and polarimetry. So that was really the, the, the breakthrough we needed uh, to go for general relativity and play with the black hole as if it's a laboratory 
experiment. In 18, when this star was coming back, uh, you see Sag A star there on the top, uh, you would see uh, the star S2 and Sag A star very clearly separated. If you look below in the, in the images below, on the left side, that's an adaptive optics image like the Keck or we would get. And it's highly confused because when, when Sag A star and S2 are so close, the images run into each other, but not so with interferometry, which is on the right side. There you can clearly beautifully separate uh, the two objects and in fact make a simple triangulation uh, measurement of the separation with scale, with, with accuracies, as I said, of tens of micro arc seconds. And so with this instrument, then in, 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 we could see the motions uh, from day to day, as you see above there during, during the Perry time, very, very accurately and construct the orbit, delineate the mass, measure the distance and see the first effects of general relativity. So let me then tell you what we found. The first effect we saw, and the Keck group saw it uh, a little later uh, because they didn't have gravity, but well, after the same effect, is the so-called gravitational redshift. So if photons are coming from the star uh, towards us, they have to climb out of the uh, gravitational potential well provided by the, by the black hole. And that redshifts the radiation by about 200 kilometers per second out of the 7,000. Uh, and so by measuring this very accurately, you can look at the residual between uh, the actual data, which are the red points over time uh, versus what you would expect from Newton, which is the zero level and labeled Newton. And you clearly see that the points follow the blue curve, not the black curve. And the blue curve is what GR predicts. So here we have a detection of the gravitational redshift to about 25 uh, significance elements to 4%. So it's very clearly uh, detected in, in this star. The next effect uh, we wanna see is the precession of orbits. So in contrast to Newton theory, where a, uh, if you have a, a single uh, point source moving around another point source, that, that orbit is stable in space uh, uh, in, in uh, general relativity, the orbit precesses. The precession is the faster, the larger the mass and the closer you come to it. So in the case of the galactic center and the uh, star S2 on the right side, you see uh, the residual uh, motions uh, in X coordinate, which is left, and Y coordinate, which is right, right around the peri, which is this uh, region, which is dotted with an uh, uh, elliptical. Now, in order to set the angle to, the, uh, to, a, to a number, we've set the angle to zero at the apo in 2010 in both cases. So because the orbit is so elliptical, the precession is not just a, a continuous motion, it's a highly uh, you know, rapid kink in the orbit. And essentially it's almost only in right ascension. So it basically does not process until very close to Perry. And then it processes very rapidly. Now in angle below, that's the angle. It's exactly the 12 arc minutes from before to afterwards, which you would expect. So we again have confirmed uh, the predictions of general relativity, in this case, to about six sigma. Uh, so we are not as good as in the, in the larger gravitational redshift, but it's a beautiful confirmation of general relativity. So here you see the measurements and you see how well they track uh, the GR prediction in red here, both in terms of X, Y, and then in the angle. Now the next effect uh, we wanted to look at um, was the emission from Sagittarius A star itself. 
the black hole in the galactic center is not black, actually. It's, it's not very bright, but it's varying continuously in brightness because uh, there's a hot plasma around it. The central accretion zone uh, outside of the event horizon has a temperature of about 10 billion degrees, and that produces synchrotron emission, mostly in the radio uh, millimeter range. But sometimes if uh, electrons are accelerated above the virial level, they can produce infrared radiation and, and also even X-ray radiation. So we had seen that for the first time in 2003, and a number of theorists, in particular Broderick and Loeb and others, had predicted that what we are seeing here might be the effect of gyrating uh, electrons in magnetic fields uh, where the acceleration is due to reconnection of, of the magnetic field lines in this very turbulent plasma, in which case you might expect hotspots to be formed, which then live for a certain period, but while they live, they would move. So we looked for that in 2018. So on the right side, you see basically sort of a, you know, a, a cartoon picture of what you might expect uh, outside of the event horizon size, this red uh, uh, hot, hot zone, which initially is compact, but then it's tidally sheared into a long, uh, into a long banana before it then, uh, you know, uh, cools down and is not seen anymore. In below, in th on three occasions, we saw such motions on the scale of about five to ten times uh, the gravitational radius, or three to three to six times the Schwarzschild radius, with orbital periods of say forty-five minutes and an orbital speed of about a third the speed of light. That's about exactly what you would expect from near Keplerian motion around a four million solar mass. So by the end of this phase, uh, we have learned now something about the innermost region uh, uh, right around the black hole for the first time dynamically. But we also learned something about the magne magne magnetic field structure itself. Because the magne magne magnetic field would polarize our light, and we could measure that as a function of time and see the polarization direction move orbit, in fact, a full orbit on the same time scale as the dynamical orbits. And that you would expect if the fields as seen in the simulation on the right are very strongly poroidal. So what you see there is the expected in a simulation, the expected magnetic field directions of a black hole whose poroidal direction is more or less up and down. And then the right and left side is where the gas is coming in, where the, the fields are relatively weak. So the measurements we have seem to look just like that simulation from, from Ressler et al. And it tells us immediately that the, the magnetic fields are very strong, probably dynamically dominant, which is uh, something actually many theorists had not, had not predicted. This is a new field beyond general relativity, of course, uh, to learn about the innermost region around a black hole, which I'm sure will attract much attention uh, in the next years, also from one millimeter VLBI observations with the Event Horizon Telescope. Another aspect of this work we've been undertaking is uh, learning something about the astrophysics of a star cluster around a black hole. So imagine you have a massive black hole like in the galactic center, and you place that in the middle of a dense star cluster. And let's for, for now think the star cluster is spherically symmetric. Then theory tells you that you should have a very strong concentration of stars in the center, a so-called cusp. And, and the further the, you come to the center, the more stars there should be. Well, actually, it's not that simple because uh, if you put a star on the outside of this field here, it takes some time to spiral inwards. It takes, in fact, a so-called relaxation time. And that's very long in the galactic center. It's about two to five giga years. That's much longer than the mass of stars we see see in the galactic center. So in fact, if you look at the 
pictures of 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 the central star cluster, the bright objects we are seeing there are moving. They're moving in a, what looks like a fairly coherent uh, disk-like motion uh, clockwise on on the on the sky, and these are very massive stars whose lifetime is a mere few million to a few tens of millions of years. So these stars cannot really make it to the very center. Yet I showed you stars which are uh, in the very center. So how come that they were able to get into the center? So clearly we are learning something much beyond uh, simple uh, theory. And there's been a lot of work now by a number of people, uh, theory as well as observations. And I show you some of these colleagues across the world from our group, from the UCLA group, but also from, from other groups, investigating that central star cluster. Clearly, what we don't see is the Bacall, Bacall Wolf cusp, which I introduced this with. That we do not see, but we see uh, massive stars, which are our elliptical orbital stars, very close to the black hole. We also see uh, very old stars near the black hole, but the bigger stars are not. So the cluster is much more complicated, complicated than, uh, than we would have thought. Finally, of course, you might ask, well, okay, it looks like a black hole, but uh, how do we know it's not a double black hole? Or could it, could it be that around a big, big black hole, uh, there is a second, uh, say, intermediate mass black hole? In fact, that's something which we've uh, very much tested with our gravity observations also. And from work uh, of uh, our postdocs, we can now be sure that we can exclude an intermediate black mass black hole anywhere between a few hundred solar masses and say 10,000 solar masses, anywhere near the uh, black hole, uh, uh, which in this case would be at the very bottom of the, of the diagram. So this does seem to be a, a, you know, a single uh, 4 million solar mass black hole. There probably are some stellar black holes there and maybe, maybe some other lower mass stars. Those we would dearly like to see because they would be able to give us a view at the spin of the black hole. And we haven't done that yet, but we are on good, good track to improve the sensitivity of the interferometry in the Gravity Plus project, which uh, Martin Strutman already mentioned at the beginning. So here we are 40 years later. We now know the 4 million solar masses to about 0.3% statistically and maybe 0.7% systematic error. We know that this mass is within four Schwarzschild radii, way inside of the sphere of influence. That's clearly the best case we have currently by far, that massive black holes really are, uh, 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 exist in the universe. So are we done? Should we stop now? I'm 68, so a good time to, to go and, uh, and uh, maybe have, uh, go for, for bird watching or something like this, as Charlie Towns would do in his late years. Why well, sure not, because we have work to do. We want to actually test uh, that the curve, curve spacetime uh, of a spinning black hole describes the object very near the innermost region. And that's a relationship between all higher moments and the spin in the mass. According to the Kerr space metric, only the spin, A in this equation, uh, and the mass, M, are needed to, for instance, predict the quadrupole moment of the of the black hole. This number epsilon there is zero. The black hole does not have any hair. So how are we doing in astrophysics on testing that? It's remarkable that 100 years after the theory, there is now so much vigorous activity trying to do all the same. The X-ray astronomers are looking at uh, the so-called K-alpha uh, line width and look at their var variability and have constrained epsilon to be less than a few. 
the uh, uh, LIGO uh, collaboration has seen in spirals of stellar black holes and have constrained that epsilon to be less than, say, a half. Our hotspots probably also constrain in Sag A star epsilon to be less than on the order of one. So we have done already some work, but we would like to make this very significant. The Event Horizon Telescope, together with uh, the mass of the stars uh, from our experiment, uh, if they would see a so-called shadow in the galactic center, they would push that number epsilon to say a half. If we had gravity and, and some faint star very close to the black hole so that we get the spin, we could do better. Gravity with such a star and the Event Horizon Telescope would do better by another factor of three, et cetera, a pulsar. With the ELT, we could still do better. And then in 20 years from now, the ultimate experiment will be launched, which is LISA. This is a experiment, tremendously ambitious, of three spacecraft measuring in space at a distance, at a separation from each other of millions of kilometers per second, the in-spiral uh, of say, stellar black holes into massive black holes. And because that takes a long time, enormous signal noise ratio can be uh, built up. Our sister institute, the Albert Einstein Institute, is gearing up for this, and I'm wishing them all the luck, although I probably won't see their success because it's still some time into the future. So as you see, we've made a lot of progress, several of us. It's tremendously exciting, but we are not done yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And uh, this, is, this is an example for such a long dur duration um, science, such a big project over more 40 years. And the, so many questions have been asked and so many answers appeared. And so the, um, I, it just, I should say first that everyone can ask questions with the F and A, so with the Fragen and Antwort or question Q and Q and A function. And we have already a first question for you. Um, Johannes Diel asked, in a way, you were very lucky to have a star orbiting so close whose orbit is also more or less face on. Is that right? Absolutely. We're not supposed to have that star. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I always say in the galactic center, A, this thing has been so productive for so many years and always providing us with new surprises. Uh, but you can turn this around. Uh, I'm so glad we didn't have to ask for a grant permission uh, to do the experiment because clearly the answer would have been there cannot be any bright star on an elliptical orbit uh, in, in near the very center because uh, the relaxation time is too long. Mm -hmm. So the ne next question from, from YouTube is, in 1996 to 1998, both groups had the mass of Sagittarius A at about 2.6 million solar masses. Now it's calculated to be above 4 so, uh, million solar masses beyond the initial error bears. What, what, what happened? What I explained that to you. So what we initially had, we had an average velocity dispersion. Mm -hmm. So to go from that velocity dispersion of an ensemble uh, to the mass, you have to make an assumption about the average distribution of orbits. And so it, this, this is basically a geometric factor. And so uh, what we did, we assumed circular orbits and an isotropic distribution. Mm -hmm. In reality, the, orb, the, the motions are much more uh, elliptical and therefore they are much higher. Uh, and so that you need a higher mass to explain that. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I, my, my, my personal question is of, uh, has of course to do with the, with the magnetic field you showed. Uh, is there a direct relation between the rotation of the accretion disks and, and the magnetic field? Um, no, we don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. It is likely, and in fact, the simulations uh, would say the same thing at this point, that under such low uh, densities in the accretion flow as in as we have in the galactic center that flow really is very low density such that the magnetic b a beta factor is is a, above one okay it's a it's a magnetically dominated plasma uh, so it's a under such 
cases, it's a not clear that the uh, that the accretion disk is actually perpendicular to the to the pole of the uh, the Bardeen Patterson effect is effective. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, it's very likely that in, because the the plasma is so hot that you get sort of an individual accretion events, which can come from all kinds of directions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and depending where it is, you get different angles and, and et cetera. Um, there, there's a question. How well does the orientation of the accretion disk correlate with a galactic plane? Uh, not at all. Uh, in fact, the three flares, which we had in 2018, and of course that's work which we uh, dearly want to continue when we can go back to to Chile in the next uh, year or two. Uh, it looks more as if it's delineating the plane of the, the Owen Wolf Rayet stars, which I showed to you. Mm -hmm. So the stellar winds from, from these stars dominate uh, the gas density in the accretion flow. And that memory is probably uh, passed on to the inner, innermost region. Is there another question? I'm, I'm curious, what does it mean a black hole has no hair, has hair or no hair? <laughs> that means that basically you don't need any multiple moment uh, for its description other than the, the spin and the mass. Okay, the next question is, uh, what kind of time scale can we expect before the star falls to pray to the black hole and gets ripped apart and swallowed? The star S2 uh, would have to have a, a triple interaction, okay? And um, that can happen. Uh, in fact, uh, we are s trying to simulate that. And, and I can tell you that other people have simulated it too, of course. You know, the three-body interaction is a fierce, mm -hmm. a fierce effect. So if there is a, say, stellar black hole, which would come close to S2 on its orbit, then, you know, all hell could break loose. Yeah. One, of, one, of, one of the effects would be the star S2 is ejected out or it's ejected inward. But uh, we have not seen that yet. We are on the lookout for that. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the fact that there is a you know, dense star cluster with so many young stars in there should give us the opportunity to see these three-body effects at, at one point in the future. And that's, that's an interesting, very interesting question. Were there any points during the 40 years where you considered completely giving up no. No. Okay. <laughs> no. 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 I mean, I think. I think. Okay. There was. It was. I have to say. Uh, I'm looking at Ralph now. I mean, the. the you know, we were. We, we were very early on. Or Towns was very early on in the 70s with the the gas experiment. So we were very proud. Mm -hmm. Wrote a Nature paper, as I told you. But our colleagues uh, like Ralph or John Carmody and others looking at external galaxy, they were not impressed at all. And that was frustrating because we thought, well, you can measure these motions pretty well. Why are you not believing it? And they saw oh, gas, gas, you know, why do you need gas? You should, stars. And that's why it took us a little while to, to gear up and, and rearmor ourselves. <laughs> um, do we know anything about the origin of this central black hole? Well, okay. I mean, I think uh, it's growing very slowly. Mm -hmm. So uh, that tells us, of course, uh, that it hasn't had any major interactions lately. And if you look at the, the, the age distribution of the star cluster, that too basically tells you not much has happened since the first giga year. Mm -hmm. So I would say if we have a situation where we had, uh, you know, initially a lot of growth probably, in this early, very gas-rich phase. But since that time, not much of a major merger uh, because that's what you need. You need eddington-type accretion rates in order to really spin up the black hole and let it grow. Right now, the growth rate is, is minuscule and uh, the accretion rate is 10 to minus eight eddington. So it's, it's, it's not, not very impressive. Okay, there is another question. How, how does the spin of the black hole affect the measurement? The, the questionnaire asks, isn't a black hole uh, isotropic in every direction? Well, uh, the, clearly clearly in the central ergosphere, and in fact, the, the hot spots we are looking at uh, could be in the ergosphere, uh, depending on exactly where they are. Uh, that could be spin dependent. 
And in fact, again, you, you see immediately, my eyes are beginning to glow and I want to go down to Chile and start measuring to get more statistics on these, uh, because that's where progress might in, in fact happen. Outside of the aerosphere, unless the spin is very substantial, I mean, you wouldn't really see the effect. And I doubt, again, because of the accretion being so low that the spin is very high, unlike in M87, where the, the spin is very high. There is a, another very fascinating question. Can you already exclude alternative theories to general relativity based on your recent observations? Some, yeah, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, uh, in fact, now that we are beginning to, so to speak, slowly approach the animal, uh, we will want to work with uh, 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 true relativists. Uh, so in fact, in our Gravity Plus uh, consortium, we are now including some top level uh, uh, relativistic theorists so that they can uh, look at the data and, 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 and test that out. Coming, coming back to the, to, the, uh, to the competition of the both groups, um, there's a question, why did both groups assume circular instead of elliptical orbits? Well, I mean, that's, that, seems, that seemed initially the best, most trivial answer. And, and you know, you look up in a book, you get a, a simple, a simple uh, correction factor uh, for this sort of average uh, motion. We could have used elliptical orbits, yes, we could have, yeah. Mm -hmm. So th there, there's a very nice question. Do you regret not also being an Olympic champion? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, look, uh, when, when, when I was 16 and, and was the Germany's best young thrower, I, yeah, I, I'd love to, but then A, you know, things go wrong. In my case, my my elbow went wrong. And then I, I knew, I knew, you know, I had to make the decision between the two and, and I, I wouldn't have gone for, <laughs> I wouldn't have, no. <laughs> okay, do you, do you, you have still um, the mood for more questions? Because there are- Sure, sure, go ahead, shoot. <laughs> the next question is, is a very big one because it's about the Big Bang. Do you think that the Big Bang was a result of everything being sucked in a singular black hole and this black hole somehow exploded, started the no. function of the okay. No, I don't think so. But I mean, more relevant as, as you know, and, and Volker Springel and, and Ralph, and you could comment on this, because we seem to have such a hard time seeing a supersymmetric uh, uh, particle, which could be dark matter in the laboratory, the idea of uh, primordial black holes as, as at least part of dark matter is becoming uh, more, more interesting. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's something I cannot really comment on this. I, I think no, nobody really can, but, because you, you, you should, one has to know then something about what was before the Big Bang. That's right. There is a next question. Any chance to see Hawking radiation from this? No. Like, no. Okay. Just it's too big. Too big. Too big. It will take too long, right? So could we hope to see dark matter have any observable effect? Well, OK, there have been various uh, models, uh, predictions. Uh, you, you know, so assuming, first of all, assuming a, a cusp uh, like the dark matter distribution and, you know, then they're making some further assumptions. You can, of course, predict, roughly speaking, the dark matter density. And people have done that and uh, written papers about it. And I would say our limit currently on any deviation from the Schwarzschild precession is um, not interesting in, in that risk. Still little dark matter you would expect in this, this innermost region. I have here two questions which I would put together because they, they, they both concern you as a person, what was the most memorable moment for you during this 40 years? And what was your biggest inspiration? Well, I would say initially, of course, it was Towns. Mm -hmm. Because Towns was uh, such a towering figure. I mean, if I, if, I, if I now recall your wonderful eulogy at the beginning of this, what would you have said about Towns? I mean, you know, he, <laughs> oh, wow. And, and uh, much, of, much of the style of research, I would say, I've sort of carbon copied from, from Charlie. Uh, this, this, 
is wanting to have a, a team of people who do experiments as well as astronomy. Mm -hmm. That was something which, of, of course, as you know, is rare in astronomy. I mean, Ralph, Ralph said that, and uh, that, that's how the Towns Group uh, operated, okay? But then, I mean, I, I still remember the, the Perry in 2002. Uh, I, I, I was not prepared to make any analysis. And then mm -hmm. Thomas Ott came in and, and showed me the first data. And I, I took sort of an ellipse and, and measured half axis. And, 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 <laughs> and, and sure enough, there, there it was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Your remark regarding the slow evolution of uh, time evolution of the black hole brings uh, um, Johannes Reitz to the question, how far can such a black hole be considered as a seed for galaxy formation? Is it thinkable that the black hole existed before the galaxy? Um, this particular size, I don't think so. I, I'm not sure I can't, I'm, I, I can't say. If you, if, you, if you assume that at Redshift 2, Uh, a significant fraction of the cosmic volume is filled with a million solar mass black holes. I think there's too much X-ray radiation, but maybe maybe somebody else in the audience can comment on this. There is a, a, a very short question: are, are black holes perfect spheres? Well, no, not if it's rotating. I mean, uh, right. Okay. The theory of general relativity seems to be proven in man, many different fields. Do you think there will ever be a unification of the standard model and general relativity in the future? Well, okay. I mean, I think uh, obviously we are, we are, uh, let's keep that in mind again. I try to make that case. Uh, the theory has been uh, around for a long time. Uh, for, forever it was worth. Uh, it took 60 years before it, it could be put to the test outside of the solar system and, and, the, and the laboratory. And now we are going to the more extreme environments and you know and I projected forward how much longer it would take until we get to the to the the care tests of any uh, so, so these these kind of things uh, you know take take a long time uh, but uh, uh, the excitement is great if you look at a number of papers on on black holes both theoretically as well as uh, experimentally right now believe it or not it's ex exponential Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 incredible. Yeah, so it's like it's like the virus. It's <laughs> <laughs> putting, putting all the 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 the, the recent measurements of uh, direct uh, observation of gravitational fields together. It seems that general relativity seems to be an extremely successful theory, and it will be a hard time to to put this together with the. Uh, Quantum yeah, field, obviously. So, sure, so. because I mean, you know, it, unless you have naked singularities, uh, how how do we ever get to the point where the, the theory definitely should fail, which is in the in the central singularity, right? And as you as you said before, uh, Hawking radiation. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't serve on that. I mean, that's. It's even, it's too long, as you said, even for a Max Planck director, these time scales are too long. Uh, yeah. The next question is, as general relativity has stood the test of, of several various experiments, what should be the next target to be further for our outstanding um, understanding about fu fundamental laws of the universe? Why do we expect deviations from general relativity? Because of course it must be wrong. Mm -hmm. We, we were just discussing that, right? It must be wrong, number one, because of the central singularity that can't be right. And the next thing is because of the information paradox. Okay, so clearly, if we if we could get, for instance, get at the uh, Hawking radiation of a, of a mini uh, black hole in a, in an extreme small uh, volume, maybe it's not a black body radiation, right? And you could see the information in there. Mm -hmm. So that would be something for I don't know, surviving humans in three billion years uh, to think about. Let's see. Let's see. Now, now the questions get really, really, really very broad. I can see. Yes. <laughs> you, also, you know, you know, Harald, you, you remind me of my PhD thesis. Yeah. When, when, when there was a, the, the, okay, there was the astronomy text, uh, astronomy exam, but then there was also a physics exam, and 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 basically I went to the in Bonn to the physics professor, and, and he said, so what what should I? ask you about, and I said, well, how about atomic physics? 
and 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 so so he asked me at, atomic physics for 55 minutes and 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 i, I sort of knew what and then he said, well, you, you seem to know everything about t atomic physics, but for a very good physicist, you should also know something about nuclear physics. <laughs> I lasted about one minute longer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In your opinion, what is a key property uh, that characterizes a good physicist and what would you suggest to young physicists at the beginning of their careers? Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I'm not a sage. I would say some of the things which have been said before is, is, is important. Clearly, you have to be able and willing to, to really uh, get engaged and, 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 and work hard. Uh, I mean, it doesn't help. Yes, you can be brilliant, but that's not enough. Towns would always say, here coming back to Towns, Towns would always say, if you look at the uh, distribution functions of uh, scientific researchers, uh, then it's a log normal distribution. It's not Gaussian. It's log normal, mm -hmm. and that tells you, you know, in reverse, it has to be a, a number of characteristics and yeah. luck, and so on. And luck, yes, it's which is uh, which you can't uh, which you can't buy, right? So, what do you? So there is a, um, another more technical question. What, what do you think is a likelihood that supermassive black holes could be formed from primordial black holes? So coming back to the black hole business again. I, you know, I'm looking at Volker Springle's uh, picture. I mean, uh, this is a question on simulations, whether some simulations have in fact put put that into their simulations and, and see whether, I, Volker, can you comment? Um, sure, I can comment on this, but um, I think we don't know where the black holes come from originally. Um, they could be of primordial origin. It's a speculative idea, I think, um, but we can produce them in other ways, as you know. Uh, it's very hard to make them very massive early on to reproduce and explain the uh, 10 to the nine solar mass black holes, you know, in the first 600 million years of the universe. That's, that's very hard. And uh, I think they, those, you know, could grow out of primordial ones too, but um, those would be of low mass as well. So I think it's, a, it's one of the many you know, open questions that, you know, maybe in 10 years or in 100 years uh, earn someone else the Nobel Prize <laughs> in our field. <laughs> so, so, let's go. <laughs> okay, so there, is a, there is also a question of what, are there any, um, when you, you are also um, extremely involved in, in uh, instrument building, Reinhard, is there any new development in instrument building in astrophysics that could also prove useful in other fields, actually? So, so, well, I mean, I, I would say, generally speaking, energy resolving detectors, for instance, uh, that's something which which could be enormously important for for medicine, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and people are developing them, you know, um, uh, the interferometry to some extent. Um, adaptive optics already has in in uh, uh, ophthalmology. So, yeah, no, I think there are a number of applications. Mm -hmm. So perhaps um, um, at least one of the last questions, what do you think is the hottest, most interesting field in astrophysics at the moment? <laughs> uh, I, I take the fourth amendment. amendment. <laughs> <laughs> of course, well, uh, yes. Uh, if you receive a Nobel Prize for your science and you are asked, what is the hottest, most interesting field in astrophysics? <laughs> well, maybe it's my, it's a topic I'm working on. So, I would say thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk, a wonderful uh, also round question uh, around, and um, with, with very very inspiring answers. And uh, let's see, let's hope that we can meet in 3D. And um, that will be wonderful. Yes, Nobel Prize and um, good luck, mm -hmm. and all the best for you. And uh, and congratulations and my deep respect. Thank you very very much. Thank you all for coming and listening to me. I'm very honored. Thank you.